page uh, 774. Okay. 774. This is where we got to yesterday. And we had mentioned uh, about Aaron Akoin that it says, uh, Vayas on 774, the third line from the top. It says, Vayas Kane Aaron. So um, we said that Aaron um, is uh, Aaron is uh, uh, he goes up. The last time we had spoken about beha loscha esaneros, and the second line says when you raise up the candles. So first of all, uh, uh, the idea of when you raise up the candles. We had spoken about why that's a strange case, strange terminology. And Rashi says, uh, we had read, mentioned the Rashi that says that the candles were up in the air. There were there were steps in front of the menorah. That he went, Aaron went up through these, these steps to light the menorah. We had said last time about the uh, about the what do you call Ron, while you're up, maybe you could just close those doors. The the what do you call it? Thanks. That that Aaron uh, 774. That Aaron uh, ray goes up. You, when you raise up the candles. As opposed to the way we would say is when you light the candles. Aaron says, I don't use the terminology when you raise up the candles. So we had mentioned that Rashi points out, Rashi points out that there are, uh, what do you call it, that there were steps in front of the menorah, and that's why he talks about a, 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 a terminology of raising up. But if you look at the Rashi again, if you look at the Rashi again, I want to show you another point here, where uh, it's the right column of Rashi, the fourth line, first word. It says, Behaloscha. Rashi says, Al Shem Shehalahav Ola. If you find it, please show the person next to you. It says, when the flame goes up, and therefore, therefore it says, and so by lighting them, it substitutes, instead of saying for lighting them, when you raise them up. You have to light it until the flame is burning on, uh, independently. That means sometimes, you know, if you light it and you pull your hand away, it may flicker. You have to light it and keep, thank you, thank you very much, Will. You have to light it and keep your hand against the flame until you're sure the flame is lighting on its own, that it's rising on its own. That's the, that's the plain meaning here. So the, one of the, the commentaries, I think it was Ramosha Feinstein, that's all, he says that the idea here is this is also alludes to the responsibility of somebody who's trying to educate somebody else, what the, ed, what the responsibility of a teacher is, in many cases what the parent, or responsibility of a parent, that you have to light the disciple until the disciple is burning on his own. That means you have to make sure that the disciple can now stand on his own. You have a responsibility to educate, and to educate to the point that, the, that he is now, don't take your hand away until you're sure that he is understood and he's capable of, 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 of advancing on his own, on his, under his own power, uh, number one. Number two, this does not only apply to, this does not only apply to the, to, 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 to the actual teaching, it applies to, in general, having an influence on anybody. I think everybody who embraces Yiddishkeit, everybody who comes to Torah, uh, there's always somebody in your life who you'd like to influence as well. There's always somebody in your life who you'd like to, 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 to try to, to, to hope that they, that they also get, the, uh, get some sense and, and embrace, embrace uh, you know, and, and, and they could connect up to the truth and embrace it as a lifestyle. The Torah is telling you there's only one way to influence other people. It's Beha Loscha, when you are elevating. You have to grow yourself. When people see you growing and they see you, you know, they see you uh, 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 rising in levels, that's what will pull them up. You can't preach. Preaching doesn't work. Preaching doesn't work with anybody. It doesn't work with, with, with students. It doesn't work with, with, with children. It certainly doesn't work with spouses. It doesn't work. Preaching, preaching doesn't work. You have, to, so you have to set the example. If you're working on yourself, then others will see you and they may be the inspired. If they're not going to be inspired, they're not going to be, if, they, if that doesn't inspire them, nothing's going to work. And preaching certainly doesn't work. The, uh, uh, the classic example, if, if I would ask you, what would you buy your brother? Your brother is 17 years old and about the only thing that he's really interested in is microbrewing. Uh, uh, and you'd like to inspire him to become a little more spiritual. What would you buy? It's his birthday. What would you buy him as a birthday gift? So, you know, nine out of 10 Baal Chuzva surveyed I uh, say, so, you know, something like, you know, some book on Judaism, like Rabbi Tatz's book or Rabbi Kaplan's book on marriage. Uh, he's 17, it might not work, but at least I'll get some money out of it. Uh, <laughs> what do you call it? You know, something, uh, something along those lines. You know, now, if your brother was studying, if your brother was studying Greek history, 
and it was your birthday, would you like him to buy you uh, the, the big book on Greek, on Greek history? You know, you, you know the, the, that's the last thing I want. A, I might say, you're interested in it, I'm not interested in it. What would you, why, why, why would you buy that for him? Your brother's birthday, you buy him a baseball glove. You buy him a, you buy him a, what, what do you, a year's, a year's free pass to the local tavern. You know, something that, something that he's interested in, not something you're interested in. That's something you're interested in. The only way to inspire people is to show that you come. And by the way, just on the subject, if you do want to influence your family, leave out the, the man to God mitzvahs. Don't talk about mezuzahs and don't talk about prayer. And don't talk, that, that's not going to move, that's not going to inspire anybody. If you work on the man to man mitzvahs, right, if you come home and you want your parents to, to, to you want, and you go out and you mow the lawn without being asked to do so, or you wash the dishes without being asked, then your parents are impressed. They say, well, you know, the, the 24-year-old good-for-nothing who never picked up his finger around the house suddenly realizes that we are present. You know, so I don't know what they did to you in that yeshiva cult over there, but you're going back, you know, because <laughs> something worked, something, got, something happened. That's the only thing that works. So the Torah is telling you over here, but you know, work on yourself. Work on yourself. By the way, with, with children in the home, that's, that's all that works. The children at home, children don't, children don't do what you tell them. Children don't, you know, there's a, you know, a goalie. I'll get to you one second. I'll hold for a second. There was a, there was a, go, a hockey goalie played for the New York Islanders named Billy Smith. They are going back when the Islanders had a, had a, had a dynasty. And uh, Billy Smith was considered the dirtiest player in the NHL. Because when opposing players would skate past, there's only one part of a hockey player's body that's not protected. That's the calves. The calves, he's got his socks on, but he has, he has pads in front. He doesn't have anything on the back. And as they would skate past, if they got close enough to Billy Smith, so Billy Smith would take his goalie stick, which is a nice thick piece of lumber, and if they got too close, he would nail it. He would slash them on the back of the calves, which was not appreciated uh, by anybody other than his own teammates. And uh, so then Billy Smith Jr. was nine years old, and he started playing peewee hockey. And of course, he's going to be a goalie like Daddy. And so a, a, an interviewer asked Billy Smith Sr., is your son going to be slashing the peewees? So Billy Smith said, no. And he said, how do you know? He says, I told my son, don't do as I do, do as I say. Right? That's what he said. I guarantee you the peewees were limping. Right? Because children don't do as you say, children do as you do. And as a person realizes that you want to inspire your children to be good Jews, right? If your child sees you studying Torah, then chances are he'll study Torah. If your child sees you davening and not talking in shul, chances are that's what he's going to do. Doing the opposite and telling your kid what to do, that, that, that never works. That never works. It just doesn't work with kids. It doesn't work. And, 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 and you know, kids see, they see everything. They, we, our parents think that kids, from the earliest age, kids see everything. From two years old, three years old, four years old, they're already absorbed. They see exactly what's going on in the house. And when kids play mommy and daddy once in a while, and they imitate the parents, right? That's when you get to see what the kids are really saying. You know, sometimes it's very nice, sometimes it's very pleasant, sometimes it's like, oh, mm. I, I told you, I think my son, my oldest son was three years old. My oldest son was three years old, We're going back almost 30 years. He was three years old, and I come down, I come into the kitchen, it's like late at night, and the refrigerator door is wide open. He's got a big bottle of pop in his hand, and he's drinking from the bottle like this. He's drinking from. And my first thought was, now where did he learn to do that? Uh, and I realized he must have seen my wife drinking out of the bottle. You know. <laughs> so you know, you know, you, 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 you what do you call it? You know, you know, okay, drinking out of a, drinking some Pepsi out of a bottle is not the end of the world. It's not the word. It's not the way. But you just realize they're watching everything. They see everything. They're watching everything. Number one. Number two. Yesterday we had left off with the next pasuk, with pasuk Gimel. Ezra, what were we going to ask? No, I realized you Okay, the uh, it worked again. The uh, what do you call it? A pasuk Gimel. It's not irrelevant. It probably is relevant. But if you have any questions, I just just hold for a few minutes. We'll take it later. It was, it was like Gaiva. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, in pasuk uh, pasuk Gimel, um, they they had you on here, so I'll tell you a terrible story. I love it. There was a uh, <laughs> there was a school graduation. A cheder from school. There's a graduation, so uh, they called these eighth graders out, and they said uh, they said to each one of these eighth graders, you know, and the parents are there, hundreds of people, and one of the uh, they said the principal is up there on the stage, and he calls the first goer and he says, Hey, Yankee, what's a mitzvah in your home that the family does enthusiastically? What's the big enthusiastic mitzvah? So the kid goes, you know, hundreds of people. He goes, 
tzitzis, the mitzvah of tzitzis. We all wear tzitzis, big tzitzis, we make tzitzis, and everybody's like, oh, that's terrific. He calls in and saying, hey, Yitzi, he says, what's the mitzvah at your home? That everybody says, we like chesed. You know, we always help people. We do this. The third boy, what do you do? Studying Torah. We're always studying it. Wonderful. Everybody's clapping. Calls the fourth guy. He says, what's the mitzvah in your home that everybody's with tremendous enthusiasm? He goes, eating cholans. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, his parents are <laughs> by a cringing in the principal. Yeah, and the principal quickly hurries up. You know, he finishes the ceremony. And then afterwards, he calls him over. He says, Abikai. He's like, why, why did you say that? You know, your parents are... He says, I don't understand, what do you want? You know, every Shabbos, you know, we're sitting at the Shabbos table, and, you know, we talk, maybe somebody says it's our Torah, you know, my father's half asleep, and then my mother brings out the chont, and it's like my father goes after it like there's no tomorrow. You know, he's, he's just totally cholted. You know, he's into the cholt, and he finishes the cholt, and he just collapses on the couch, and that's it. I mean, that's what he does. You, you asked me, what are we doing? He's a lot more enthusiastic about the cholt than he is about the, about the parsha. What can I tell you? <laughs> so, so, you know, the kids are seeing everything. They, they, they see absolutely everything. I was once, I was once sitting at a table. I was eating supper. My wife was chasing the kids around the house. They wanted to get a bath. They were getting ready, and I'm eating supper. And my son at the time was about, he's about six. This was the other son. And he comes over. I'm sitting there, I'm eating supper. And he comes over and he kind of looks at me like that. He puts his hand on He's looking, watching me eat. And I'm like, you know, I'm eating. And at a certain point he says to me, Daddy, do you love to eat? I was like, you know, whoa. You know, so I gave some lame answer like, you know, do, do we love to eat? We don't, we don't eat because we don't love to eat. I mean, we eat because Hashem wants us to eat. It's like some along those lines, you know, something like, like that. And then, you know, he go, oh, you know, and then he turned from philosopher, then he went and beat up his sister or something. You know, he, he, went for, he went from philosophy to the man of action. You know, he goes on. And I just wondered, how come he never came over and he said, Daddy, do you love to learn Mishnayas? That he never said to me. Why, why, why do, they, do you love to eat? Then he said, obviously he saw something, he picked up something in my relationship to the food that he didn't see, and, and uh, else, you know, a person has to know, they, they see everything, they notice, you could talk the talk, but you, they, better, they better see it, they better see it. I, there was one family, I once read about a family, where a mother used to announce, okay, who needs to eat supper? Who needs to eat? They didn't say who wants to eat, they said who needs to eat. It's a very subtle thing, and I wouldn't, I don't recommend doing that, because we're human, we're not, we're not the, uh, you know, seventh generation B'nai Brak, hey, we, we're, we're human and we, we're, 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 we, we, we know who we are, what our level is, but just think about that. Think about the difference between what you're communicating, who wants to eat, you know, who wants to eat, you know, you know if you're an American teenager, you know, that, that's one of your hobbies. You know, eating is a hobby, it's not, uh, it's not what, I, was once, I was once on the phone with my brother, it was vacation time. So the kids are all home from school, the kids are in the house, they're in and out of the house. So my brother and I were, 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 were talking, were commiserating about how the teenagers, especially the boys, you know, half the day they spend, he said to me, yeah, they were always at the refrigerator. You know, as they walk through the kitchen, as they walk through the kitchen, they'll just check the refrigerator. You know, as they walk through, there's like, a, like, a, like just a security check to see what's in there. He, and he's in the middle of talking, and also he, he goes, right now, he just walked in. He tells me about his son. He just walked in right now. He's at the refrigerator right now. He's out there checking the refrigerator. He says, that's the, that's the, yeah, that, that's what, that's the first thing. That's the Mahalosa. Okay, now yesterday, we went to Pasa Gimel. And we said, We pointed out the Rashi. And I told you, the, Ra the Rashi is seven lines from the bottom on the right column. And we said, And this is a kind of a, and we mentioned this yesterday that this is a, there, there's something very odd about this Rashi because Rashi says, "Lahagid shivcha shel Aaron." This tells the praise of Aaron shaloshina. He did not change. He did not veer off of the instructions. He lit the menorah as his job. And we asked yesterday, "Well, why would he veer off?" So the answer we gave yesterday was that Aaron was a person who was mishana mipnei shalom. He was in the habit of veering off of the accurate, of the absolute truth in order to maintain peace between couples that were that were struggling. And we've spoken about this concept that. People, a person has to know that sometimes you have to be able to turn it on and turn it off. And we mentioned like generals in the army, uh, when you come home you cannot be a general anymore. And I, I had a kid once whose father was a principal of a school. And principals, when you're running a school, you have to run a school a certain way. But you can't run your home the same way you run a principal. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't you know, be, run your home in the relationship with your children. It has to be different with, with, with a principal. I had a kid once, I said to him, Would you, when you, do you want to become a principal like your father? Then never, no way. 
I said, why not? He said, you can't imagine what it's like to be raised in the principal's office. Mm. Right? He felt his father raised the home was the prin like being in the principal's office. So I have found that with the sons of rabbis also. I don't mean, I don't mean teacher rabbis, I mean the more pulpit rabbis. Pulpit rabbis, I've asked kids, would you want to become a pulpit rabbi like your father? And I've found that there are two answers that I get. It's either absolutely yes or absolutely not. There's very, never, never, never parv. They were like, I don't know, maybe we'll see, you know, it's either that or, you know, be our accountant, you know. It's either definite, a definite yes, that it's been a positive experience, or a definite no. Not that he necessarily has had negative experience, but he's seen his father's experiences. And he's not interested in doing that. So here it says, Arundin Virov. So that's a deeper explanation here, and that's what we left off with yesterday. I heard from Rabbi Schiller Sr., the Rosh Yeshiva. So he said like this, I made a bracha before. He said... There are two pieces of equipment in the base of Migdash. You know, each one of the pieces of equipment in the base of Migdash represented something. So, for example, the table with the showbreads on it represents kingdom, prosperity. The king is in charge of the Jewish people, of making sure that we're prosperous, that, we're, that the economy is good, and so on and so forth. The Mizbeach, the altar, is symbolic of the, of the Kohanim, right? the Kohana Kahuna. There are two pieces of equipment that symbolize Torah. One of them is the Aron Kodesh, the Holy Ark, which is hidden away in the Holy of Holies. And the second piece of equipment, which represents Torah, is the menorah, this menorah over here. What's the difference between them? What's the difference between the Aron Kodesh and the menorah, the, the, the two aspects of Torah, which are obviously what? Torah She Biksav and Torah She Baal Pet. So Torah Shebek Sav is the blue book in front of us right here. This is the blue book. This is Torah Shebek Sav. And the Aron Kodesh had the Torah in it. And the same way that we cannot tamper or touch or change or adjust Torah Shebek Sav, where was the Aron Kodesh? It was inaccessible in the Holy of Holies. Nobody could approach it except for the Kohen Gadol once a year on Yom Kippur. And that's the Torah Shebek Sav. One of the ironies of Jewish life, is there a Gemara anywhere in there? They have that Gemara right next to you. Uh, uh, yeah. One of the great ironies of, of Jewish life is that this book over here is the written Torah. This book I'm holding in my hand is the oral Torah. Now this is one of the great ironies of Torah life because when you open up the oral Torah, this is the oral Torah. Right? The oral Torah has, on one page, you've probably never seen a book that has more print on it than our oral Torah. And the print is small, smaller, smallest, and microscopic, right? This is, this is the oral Torah. And, and, and then you get to the back of the book, and you got pages like this, and then you got entire shelves, and this is all the oral Torah. This right here is the written Torah, right? Which is, you know, it begs, a, begs an explanation for, for the oral Torah. Okay, so we understand that the nature of the oral word uh, requires more more elaboration, and the more you elaborate, the more you have to elaborate, and therefore the oral Torah is absolutely endless. But that's one of the ironies that this is the Torah Shabal Ped. This is the Torah Shabal Torah Shabal Ped. It's not very big. It's just this one book with, with, you know, the writing on each page is not very much. That's the entire written Torah. The entire written Torah is the Aron Kodesh. It's inaccessible to us. We can't touch it. We can't, touch, we can't make any adjustments. The oral Torah is the menorah. The light of the menorah represents the human contribution. Where does the light come from? Aaron lights the menorah. It's the same way when you're learning a piece of Gomorrah, or you're learning oral Torah, you have to come up with your own novelty, your own ideas. Even when you're learning Chumash, the written Torah, you could come up with a creative insight, which is what we call a chidush, a novelty, a novel explanation, a novel interpretation of something that's going on. There's only one thing you always have to remember. There's a difference, and we've mentioned this many times in the past. There's a difference between chiddush, which is a novelty, and shinui, which is a change. That means when you play chess, when you play chess, you can be very creative on a chessboard. I don't know if any of you play chess. Bobby Fischer was known for incredible creativity on the chessboard. Incredible creativity. That's fine. As long as it's with the, but if you play me, my creative move is actually jumping over pieces with my rook, mm. right? Which is why I win a lot, <laughs> right? Uh, so others may call it cheating, right? I call it creativity. I call it chiddush. 
right? No, 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 that's not Chiddush, that's cheating. That's Shinui, that's changing from the rules of the gang. Aaron is lighting the menorah, which represents the oral Torah. Lahagid shivcho shel Aaron shelo shina. He did not change. That's a lesson for us. When we're within the parameters of the halacha, or Torah study, whatever it is, we are allowed to be creative. You can be creative. You can't change things. If you change, you reform. That's reform. That's what it means, reforming. Reforming means you're changing it. Rabbi Gottlieb once told a story about this guy. A, a guy was in a sociology, I think a sociology class. And the teacher reads the list of the, uh, the names. And he sees, uh, he sees one of the names is uh, McCarthy. He says, McCarthy, you're Catholic, aren't you? He says, yeah. Maybe you could tell us something about your religion. So McCarthy spends about 10 minutes talking about Catholicism, covers the subject. And then uh, he sees another guy, Mohammed. He says, you're a, you're a Muslim. Maybe you could tell us something about your religion. So he gets up and talks about, you know, talks about Islam. And he sees the name, he says, Goldman. He says, you're Jewish, aren't you? He says, yeah. He says, maybe you could tell us something about your religion. He says, I'm sorry, sir, I can't. He says, why not? He says, because I'm Reformed. He says, so, well, mate, don't you think you ought to know something about your religion before you reform it? <laughs> as a result of that, I mean, that got it. they got to write the kishkis. And as a result of that, he embarked on a process which eventually caused him to, to become from, and then he got involved in outreach and, and, and bringing other people back because of one line. How's that, how's that for a Moser Shmuz? Right? <laughs> they didn't expect that Moser Shmuz right? yeah, from, 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 a, from a teacher in a university. Right. I don't know, Rabbi Weinbach once told us about these two Israeli guys who were, who were eating at some restaurant in Scotland, did not have the badats, hefshir on it. Uh, they were eating at a restaurant in Scotland, which is completely treif, and they made their order, and the proprietor was not Jewish, comes over to them. These two Israeli guys are sitting at the table, and he comes over to him, he says, uh, puts down the food, he says, can I ask you a question? Do you mean to tell me your people have suffered 2,000 years just so you could eat the same food we do? <laughs> so you never know when you're going to get the Moser. At the end of the day, that's what it means, Melamed Shaloshina. Okay, take a look, take a look, yeah, yeah, you get, you get Moser from the, from the funniest places, like when your son asks you if you love to eat. <laughs> take a look at uh, the next Pasuk Vav. Vaydabra Hashem al Moshe Lemar, Kaches HaLevim Itoch Bnei Yisov Etiharta Osav. Take the Levim from the Jewish people, and there means that they're going to be put into a uh, uh, into the into oh. Hashem service, and then it says, um, "Take the Levim, the Chosas Elohim." This is what you should do. The Matarim Hazayale Mechatos, sprinkle water on them. The Haviru Sar Al Kol Besorim the Chipsu Bigdem Vezitaharu. They have to shave all parts of their body with a blade, all visible hair on their on the on the Levim has to be shaved with a razor. Now. That's problematic, isn't it? Why? Yeah, you're not allowed to put a blade to your face. You're not allowed to put a blade to your face. You're not allowed to shave. There's a prohibition in the Torah that says that you're not allowed to shave with a razor. It's called hashchasa. Oh, hold, hold the question. There, it's called hashchasa. And uh, the, the letter of halacha says, the letter of halacha says there are five points on the face, which are approximately one, two, three, four, and five. We don't know exactly where they are. Therefore, we do not use an open razor on our face. You could use a shaver if it's a scissors cutting action, or you could use some sort of, uh, what do you call, sulfur-based hair removal, but you cannot use an open razor on your face. There are different ideas, there are different ideas that are contained in the prohibition. One of the ideas is that, the, that the, the, uh, uh, it was one of the rites of the idol-worshiping priests, and we try to do everything different. That's why a priest in modern Hebrew is called a galach. A galach, the word legalach means to shave. The priests were clean shaven, and that's also the prohibition of, of, of shaving the head you know, where they have, there's that type of haircut where you cut all the way around. I don't know what it's called. What's it called? A fade or something? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. They call it a fade. So we're not allowed to do that. And the Sephorno, the Sephorno says that that was a haircut style. Uh, the, 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 the Sephorno said that that, that, that style was, there are Chomashu over there, Jake. But reach him over, Chomashu. The, 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 the Sephorno said, no, Jake, there's, on the other table, there's a, the Sephorno says that there, that there was a hairstyle that was, that was, uh, uh, um, employed by uh, the wording of the Sephorno is fools, drunks, and priests used to use that uh, used to use that, that 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 fade haircut, and the idea of not shaving with a razor. Interestingly enough, one of the commentaries very fascinating reason he says at a deeper level, it's called hashchasa. When you shave with a razor, there's total removal. Hashchasa literally means to destroy. When you shave with a shaver, theoretically, a shaver doesn't get you as smooth. 
theoretically, so they have what they call electric razors, which are halakhically problematic, because if the if the the head is spinning, there are two ways that a shaver works. You have the grid, and then you have the blade. Now, if the blade is cutting against the grid, that's a just an electric scissors action, which is permissible. But there are these what are they call the uh, lift and cuts, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so, so what's really happening there is pulling the skin through and hacking it out. It's not cutting it off against the grid, which means it's just an electric razor. That, that is a razor cut, which is prohibited according to halacha. Now, the idea of hashchosa, listen, this is very interesting. The Rabbeinu Bechaye is one of the Rishonim. He says like this, you see, there are five senses. We have five senses. Where are the five senses? Seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting, and touch. Where is the most sensitive, t- sense, where is our most sensitive point of touch on the body? It's a tongue. tongue. It's a tongue, because the tongue apparently has these uh, little sensors that magnify whatever it is. So if you have a cavity, you touch it with your tongue, it feels like you got a crater in there, right? And then maybe, you know, it's, it's actually very slow, because the tongue magnifies. Very, if you're ever trying to find the, the beginning of a roll of scotch tape, as I was last week, and I ran around with my finger several times and couldn't find it. You're trying to get this weird that it begins. So what do you do? I mean, let's just admit publicly, you put it in your mouth and you lick it because it, it's, it's much more sensitive. Than, if you ever have a splinter and I can't get I'm not sure, so you put it in your mouth. The mouth is much more sensitive. By the way, that's why children put everything in their mouth. A baby puts everything in his mouth because for a child, that makes it real. For the children nurse because that's so the use of it. That's the only thing, that's the only thing a baby does. They nurse, they cry, and they need to be burped. That's what the children do. But they put everything they find in their mouth because the mouth is what makes it real for a child. That's why you have to be very careful with children not to put little objects on the ground. Adults later on put things in their mouths like uh, 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 cigarettes and weed and things like that because that also makes it real. But for a child, that's only a child who's never grown up. But for, for a child, everything, everything goes in the mouth. So the mouth, the five senses are located in this area right over here. Right over here, you've basically, can, you, you've got all the five senses. Rabbein Bahai says that the five points that are forbidden to use a razor are, correspond to the five senses, and the Torah is teaching us that we're not a bunch of ascetics. We're not, our goal of life is not to destroy our senses. That's not the goal of life. The goal of life is to make use of them with control, not to destroy them. And therefore, the prohibition of shaving with a razor symbolically means don't destroy the senses, don't remove them totally. Use the senses the way the Torah says to use them. Use them with, with, with control as opposed to unleashing them in, an un, un, without, with, 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 in a completely undisciplined manner. So the Levium here are told to shave themselves completely. The only things that they leave unshaven are those parts where there's hair growing which are not visible externally. But everything else has to be shaved. Now, the obvious question is, but the Torah says don't shave. The Torah says don't shave. So this is not the first time we find such a, something like this, because we also find that the Torah says you're not allowed to, if a man dies and he leaves a wife with children, you're not allowed to marry his wife. It's a serious prohibition, and if a man marries his, his, his brother's widow, who has had children, and they, they have a child, that child is a mamzer. Yet the very same Torah says that if the man dies childless, then it's a mitzvah for the brother to marry his wife. It's called yibum, right? The mitzvah of yibum or chalitza, whichever one you do. But there's a bond between them. The same Torah that says you're not allowed to be cruel to animals <laughs> is the same Torah that says on Yom Kippur you push a goat off a cliff. And nine out of ten goats surveyed recommend not having that done to them. So, so, so the, the same Torah that says that you're not supposed to is the same Torah that says in this case you do do it. So the question becomes what, 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 what's going on? The answer is the answer should be fairly obvious. The reason it's prohibited is because the Torah said so. The same God that said you can't shave with a razor, the God, same God that says, but here you should. Why don't we shave with a razor? Not because of a human, uh, uh, any sort of human. We don't shave with a razor because God said not to. There's a rationale for it. We find the rationale. But the same God that says don't, now here he says you should. The same God that says don't marry the widow says in this case it's a mitzvah to marry the widow. And the same God that says don't be cruel to animals, which by the way, the reason we're not cruel to animals, is not because of a human sensitivity. Because we're really sensitive, we wouldn't kill animals at all. The fact is you have a leather wallet, and you have a leather belt, and you have leather shoes, and you have a lot of leather, and not only that, you had flay for supper last night. Well, that came from an animal, gentlemen. Those weren't, those weren't impossible burgers. Those, those, those are real. 
So the same Torah that says that you're not allowed to be cruel to animals, in this case the Kedar says, for whatever reason, I don't have time to go into it now, says you push the goat off a cliff, even though it's going to fall off of the cliff and it's going to break the pieces, which is how the mission describes it. Why? Because God said so, not because of it. And the entire reason that God says don't be cruel to animals is because what it does to us as a human being. It has nothing to do with the animals. The reason we shecht shechita, the reason we shecht, which is the most the humane form of, of slaughter, is not because of the animal. If we were concerned about the animal, we wouldn't kill them at all. We are concerned about what it will do to a human being. If you take a, if you take a what do you call it, and you bludgeon an animal in Chicago in the stockyards, in Chicago they used to, you know, when they had the stockyards in Chicago, they used to kill the pigs by scalding them. Because apparently the meat was fresher that way, right? Yeah, so all the people who are worried about how inhumane shechita is, you know, but uh, somehow scalding pigs, scalding pigs is okay. So it has nothing to do with what we're concerned about the animal. It has to concern with what does it do to us and what kind of coarse person is it going to turn us into if we, if we are, what do you call it, what do you call it, if, 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 we're, if, if we are insensitive when we kill the animal. Therefore, the Torah, same Torah that says don't do it is the same Torah that says over here you should, and therefore there's no problem at all. Now, if, um, if you take a look at uh, one of the commentaries says, why is this happening to the Levian? And by the way, this is what triggered off. This right here is going to be a contributing factor into Korach's rebellion. Remember the Korach has a rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu. We're going to see that in a couple of weeks. One of the things the Medrash says is that Moshe, Korach's wife, and it's the Medrash over there, talks about how the wife makes all the difference in the husband. The, 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 uh, the, uh, um, how does it work? Behind every successful man, there stands a woman. Behind every yeah. successful woman, it has to be behind every successful woman. There's a credit card. I forgot. I forgot how it goes. <laughs> but the 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 the, the what the what do you call it? There's, there's a line. I just I forgot the joke. There there is a joke there. The uh, somebody I told you somebody once said if you're wrong, and you're willing to concede, you're smart. If you're right, and you're willing to concede. You're married, right? <laughs> Think about that, gentlemen. That's the whole story on one foot. That's the whole Torah of marriage on one foot. And it's not so easy. So in Korach's rebellion, it, his wife egged him on. Because his wife said to Korach, hey, look what this guy did. Look at this what Moshe Rabbeinu did. He takes his brother. He makes his brother the Kohen Gadol. He dresses him up with, with he dresses him up, the, the word of marriage. He, he, he fancies him up like a bride on her wedding day. You know, he puts them there with the kachoshen and the ephah with the gold and, uh, and the levium, which Korach was one of the levium, he takes and he shaves you bald like a bowling ball. Right? Look what he's done over there. So, so, Korach, so Korach says to his wife, yeah, but he did the same thing to himself. Moshe was a levy. Moshe did the same thing to himself. He said he did the same thing to himself. Yeah, that's only because it's his shtick. You know, it's always fun to do something to somebody else. You're willing to do it to yourself. She, she quotes the line from Shimshon, Tamus nafshi in plishtim. When Shimshon pushes down the pillars, he says, let me die with the plishtim as long as I take them with me. And he pushes down the plishtim. She says, that's why he did it. He did it because, so the Levim, this situation, I mean, you know, if you take somebody, you shave them completely bald, there's something about it that's somewhat degrading. Why is that? Why did they do this to the Levim? They put them through this process. Okay, at a basic level, the hair represents the excesses of life. And symbolically, the Levim, who are going to be the spiritual leaders of the Jewish people, you know, the people on the highest level, although there's no complete removal, but there is a certain lump of detachment from the physical, from the physical world. Obviously, not like, not like we find in other religion systems, but there is going to be a certain amount of of, of removal from the physical. But one of the commentaries says more than that. There's going to be a certain amount of degree de, of, of abuse, insult. That, the, the Torah leaders and people who are committed to Torah, don't we suffer abuse at the hands of others? Now, you're a bunch of parasites, and you don't work, and you don't contribute, and you don't pay taxes, which is not true. We do pay taxes, and we do work. Well, we don't work, we teach. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the Torah faithful have to get used to the idea, which the Levium symbolized. The Torah faithful, people are going to sometimes you can get insulted. People are going to people are going to put you down. People have no hesitation to to insult the Torah the Torah faithful. 
And therefore the Torah says, this is already one of the commentaries, says, this is already, get used to it, boys. Right? We're doing it to you now to show you, what, to show you what you're going to be facing down the line. That's what one of the commentaries said. Okay, now let's go on and uh, uh, um, take a look. Take a look. Yes. They're, they're, sh they're being shaved with the razor as an initiation process, right? It's a initiation, the initiation process of becoming Levian. But symbolically, there are different symb ideas here. One idea is a separation, because the hair represents the excess. Mm -hmm. Although they do leave the hair in the armpits, and they leave the hair in the private area, which represents the idea that that which is absolutely necessary, they have to stay with. That you don't, we don't go, there, this idea of what's it called, a vow, a vow of celibacy and, and, and complete separation and never getting married, all that, that, that we, we don't go for that nonsense. On the other hand, it is a life of self-control, and there's a certain behavior that's expected. I think I once gave you the example, if you saw a guy from, Ur, if you saw a guy from Ur-Samach in a kosher restaurant eating a submarine sandwich, right? You have a big sub sandwich with 17 slices of kosher meat on it. Right, trying to get this thing into his mouth. Or you see a guy, you you see a guy from Arsenal in a pizza shop wedging in four slices of pizza. Yeah, all right, yeah, no big deal. Think about the holiest rabbi you can think of. Right, I told you. If you imagine, imagine uh, if you saw if you saw what do you call it, uh, a Rabbi Samet. You know, you know, sitting there wolfing down a sub sandwich. You know, something about it rubs you the wrong way. There's something about it. I don't, I don't expect to say the rabbi of your shul. You know, really chowing down on it. You know, going for a nice thick stick. You know, one of these all you can eat. You know, they, they're, they're, there's a kosher restaurant in America. They have monster burgers. Right? There's a mon you get a monster burger. I, you know, I, and I like to eat as much as the next guy. But I, you know, I'm, a, I'm not the holiest guy in the world. But I'm not a monster. You know, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I even tell people a falafel. I tell people if you get a falafel, so I tell you, you can you can have a falafel. <clears throat> you know, you know, the, the, I always say cut the falafel in half. Cut it in half, take two halves. You get to eat just as much, but with a little more dignity. <coughs> I tell my own kids, if you're gonna eat a sandwich, cut the sandwich in half. You don't have to pick up the whole thing, you know. And <laughs> like, okay. you, get to eat, you, get as much, you get to eat just as much. You get to eat just as much, but you do it in a little, bit, a little more dignified manner. So for certain people, if the guy, if I saw a guy from Arsamech with a, with a, with a, what do you call, with a, with a laufa, what is that thing that looks like a chimney that, you, you know, Phil, you know, yeah. oh, good, go enjoy it. I got, you know, I enjoy it too, you know, that sort of thing. There's certain people I, I'd be a little disappointed. If I saw that, I'd be a little disappointed. It has to do with levels. So the Levium representing that, there, there's a little bit more, a little detachment. Okay, I want to get to a very important point here. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't have a lot of time. I want to get to a very important point. If you take a look, at Perik, uh, going on for the, for the Levium. Take a look and skip on to Pesach Chav Hay. On page 776 at the bottom. So the Torah says, three lines from the bottom, Vaidabra Hashem O Moshe 776. Zosa Asher La Levium. This is what the Levium are going to do. Mi Ben Chomesh Ve'esrim Shana Vamala Yovo Litzvot Zova Vavoda Zoboid. At 25 years old, they're going to start the service. Later on, it says at 30 years old. So there's a five-year training period. Right? They had to go five years to get their training as the Levim. The Levim were either singers, they either sang, or they were the ones who opened and closed the gates. There were two roles of the Levim. You, you stick, stuck with your role as a Levi. And then it says, Umi ben chamishim shana yoshuv mitzvah avoda, velo yavodot. At 50 years old, they retired. At a 25-year, 30, 20-year career. If you take a look, Take a look at Rashi. It's the left column of Rashi on 776. Last, le left column of Rashi, two lines from the bottom. It says, we ben chamesh ve esrim, at 25 years old, and then it says, umi ben, umi bakom acher, omer bi ben shloshim shana. Somewhere else it says, when they're 30 years old. Yeah, how do you reconcile that? Hukkate said, how do you reconcile it? Mi ben esrim ve chamesh bo lilmod hilchos avoda. He has to learn the laws. There are a lot of halachas of serving. Velo made chamei shanim. Uben shloshim oved. At 30 years, he, he, he starts working. And then at 50 years, he's finished. Once he's 50 years, take a look at the next pasuk. V'sheres es echav be'olmoid. He serves his brothers. Lishmar mishmer es avod. V'avoda lo yavod. He doesn't serve anymore. Kochata selavim mishmerosa. 
That's what you do to the Levium. And take a look at Rashi. Two lines from the top. Velo ya avodot, 778. Avodos masa He no longer carries anything. Aval chozer hu l'ni'iras she'orim l'shir. Velito nagolos. He locks the gates and he sings and he loads up the wagons. But he doesn't do the heavy work. That's what the Torah says. So I saw a fascinating, fascinating insight. He says at 25, or at 30, so a person gets involved in the heavy work. At 50, he starts closing the gates. That's what his job is when he's 50 years old. So one of the commentaries says like this, you know, when you're young and you're enthusiastic, there are a lot of things you want to do. And in Avodah Hashem, it's like that also. When you start off, you're, you're, you're eager to accomplish and sometimes to make up for lost time, and I want to study this, and I want to do this mitzvah, and I want to get involved with this. The person gets a little bit older when he's 50 years old, then you start closing the gates. That means you know when to turn down the enthusiasm. Right? Sometimes, sometimes people, <laughs> had a, I know a rabbi used to tell people, you know, calm down a little bit. Your, your, your temperature is too high. Right? Don't, don't, you're not gonna, you're not gonna become the Chafetz Chaim overnight. Right? It's gonna take a while. Right? And remember, he lived to 94. So you have to try. To, when you get to 90, we'll talk. Right? So, so a person has to know when you're young and you're enthusiastic. So very, you're eager and you want to prove yourself and you want to accomplish a tremendous amount. When a person hits 50 years old, then you start closing the gates. That means you know when to turn it on and when to turn it off. An important rule in life is an important rule. Important rule in Avodah Hashem. As, 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 what were you going to ask? Yeah. Well, well, I was just going to comment that, that it's, it's funny that the shutness is also something that the Kalim is supposed to wear, right? The, right. The, the shutness. Right. Both are from Parsha Kedoshim. Right. Kad Kadoshim contains many of the, of, the, of the rules and the mitzvahs in the Torah. Yeah. Is this a coincidence? Yeah, yeah. I, there are no coincidences in the Torah, but there's nothing, you know, there, 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 there are many of the mitzvahs are contained. Okay, Kadoshim probably has more mitzvahs than any other parsha. Maybe Kisaitse has more. Yeah, Jake, where are you? Um, so the idea that a coin should only serve from 30 to 50 years old is that. Levi, a Levi, a Levi. Yeah. Levim are Levim as well. Right, but this applies to the Levim specifically. So Kohanim can serve. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. It says Yochanan Kohen Godel was Kohen Godel for 80 years. Right. And then he became Then became a Tzaduki. Okay, but, 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 but it, 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 that's only a you know, that's, uh, Shimon Atzadik was going to go for 40 years. Right? So, so yeah, the Kohen, the, the Levim, and even the Levim, they do serve. They, they sing and they do gates. But the heavy work, the heavy work is from, is from 30 to 50. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead here. It's not it's like good, good question. We have to remain enthusiastic. We have to remain enthusiastic in life. That's an important question. We have to be enthusiastic, but like I always say, the, 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 there, there's, you can yell without making a sound, right? You can, you can, you can, uh, 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 you can dance without moving your feet. Right? Women have that ability, by the way. Women will sometimes, women can yell at their husbands without making a sound. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's what we're talking about. You can, a, per, a person, you can be very enthusiastic. I guarantee you, I guarantee you that, 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 that Reb Chaim Kanievsky was extremely enthusiastic about his Yiddishkeit. Right? But he didn't make any noise. You don't have to make noise. You don't have to make noise. Just, you know, just, just, just sometimes, I told you, I told you one, of the, one of the expressions that I use often is, is, uh, is the idea of being a religious Mr. Magoo. Right? A religious Mr. Magoo. Uh, and Mr. Magoo was a cartoon character when I was growing up. Uh, uh, Mr. Magoo was a, ca a cartoon character. Uh, the voice was Jim Backus, the actor Jim Backus. But the Mr. Magoo was this cartoon character who, who had these really big, thick glasses, and everywhere he went, he left a trail of disaster behind him. Right? And sometimes you see that people can become religious Mr. Magoos. You know, in, their, in their mad rush to become Sadiqim, they leave a trail of disaster behind them everywhere they go, like people who are rushing to kiss the Sefer Torah and elbow three other people in the head, <laughs> right, that sort of thing. And therefore, a person has to know that, you know, just, 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 just take it easy, take it easy. We're not looking for to be tzaddikim. Don't be a tzaddik, be a mensch.
Right? Don't, don't, there's sometimes people skip that, that, that mensch stage. You know, don't, don't be such a tzaddik so fast. I've never used that. Rarely, I don't think, if I did, it was certainly unintentional. I n almost never, and I've discouraged it with my own children, we don't use that expression in the house. You know, say, oh, a kid does a mitzvah. Says, oh, you're such a little tzaddik. You're such a tzaddik. I don't ever say that to my kids. You mean my four-year-old's a tzaddik and the Chafetz Chaim's a tzaddik? Mm -hmm. Oh, they, that's what, they, 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 somehow there's, something's inaccurate there. I say to them, that was a nice thing to do. You did a mitzvah, there was a chesed, that sort of thing. And talk in those terms. The other thing we never said is, we never said a wife, something you get, a, a mother says, oh, do a mitzvah, please, please do a mitzvah, take the garbage. Never spoke that way to our kids. Because if my parent, my son, somebody was said to me, do a mitzvah, take the garbage, I said, mom, I wouldn't want to take your mitzvah. <laughs> I tell the kid, do me a favor and take the garbage. Because that's why you're asking. You're not asking, you're looking for me to do a mitzvah? Other mitzvahs I could do. I could eat cholt, right? So you're, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not looking for me to do the mitzvah. Let's be honest. It's, you're miscommunicating. You're, commu you're, you're, you're not communicating honestly. So you can, do, can you do me a favor and take the garbage? By the way, it happens to be a mitzvah. And by the way, if you don't do it, you're going to be in big trouble. You know, you know <laughs> but that's honest, right? But you don't, don't know that. You'd be a tzaddik and do a bit. So I don't talk, don't worry. We're not, I, you know, maybe you're a tail. We're, we're not at that level. We're not at that level. Somebody says to me, they're going to Switzerland. They're taking a trip to Switzerland because, you know, it's a mitzvah to see Hashem's creation. Oh, uh-huh. Uh, that's why you're going to Switzerland, huh? Uh-huh. Uh, and eating the Swiss chocolate, that's, not, that's, that's also Hashem's creation. Uh -huh, uh -huh, I see. They tell me you want to go for a vacation and you want to enjoy yourself. I respect you. What's wrong? I'm going to play tennis because it's a mitzvah to take care of, my, take care of myself physically. Oh, really? You could, also, you could also do the dishes. That's exertion. Right? Uh, yeah, tell me, enjoy playing tennis. What's the problem? We're not, we're not, you're not, I'm not the Chafetz Chaim just yet. Give me a couple of days. Right? I'm, not, I'm not there yet. All right.